Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here online with us this morning. Uh, in case you missed it, uh, starting next week, uh, June 7th, we will begin a transition back to in-person uh, Sunday gatherings in our facility. Uh, and things are going to be drastically different than they were before COVID-19. Uh, and they will look differently for quite some time. Uh, we posted a video on the main page of our website, uh, which you can also find on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. Uh, that outlines what Sunday mornings are going to look like for us starting on June 7th and then moving forward. Uh, I encourage you to watch that video uh, so that you can know what to expect uh, and so that you can make the best decision for yourself and for your family uh, as to whether you will worship from home uh, or whether you will worship with us in person uh, beginning next Sunday. Uh, as much as I've really enjoyed preaching to a camera in front of some bookcases, I'm really looking forward to uh, preaching in front of a decent portion of our church family uh, in person in our facility starting next Sunday. Uh, if you do choose to stay home, uh, just know that we will continue to offer a live stream of the sermon portion of the service uh, starting uh, on our Facebook page at 11 a.m. Uh, each Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to also continue to provide a playlist of songs uh, that you can sing to from the comfort of your home uh, starting at 10 30. Uh, those songs are going to be the same songs that we're singing in person and so whether you're staying home or coming in person uh, we're going to be singing the very same songs uh, and can worship the Lord together in that regard uh, in the same way uh, that way. Well, if you're guests with us this morning, uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, you can help us get to know you by filling out an online connect card. Uh, just type in gracejourneyorlando.com slash connect card uh, into your web browser, and you'll be directed to a page uh, where you can tell us about yourself uh, and let us know about how we can come alongside you in your journey to learn more about and follow after Christ. Uh, whether you have Christian, uh, questions about Christianity uh, or are looking for a place to connect with other believers, other Christians, uh, we would love the opportunity to get to know you. Uh, if you're a member or a regular attender, uh, thanks again for worshiping the Lord with us this morning online uh, as we study the Lord's Word uh, together. Would you go ahead and pray with me uh, as we begin our time together? And uh, would you join me as we ask the Lord to speak to us um, through His Word during this time? Uh, would you pray with me? Father, we're so very thankful for your kindness and your grace towards us in Christ. God, we are so undeserving of your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. But Lord, you lavish it on us. And you pour it all over us uh, because of what Christ has done on the cross in our behalf. We are sinners who deserve your judgment and your wrath. But instead, because of Christ, we receive your mercy and your grace. And so God, I pray that you would remind us of this marvelous truth this morning. God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear your word, that you would give us the eyes to see the beauties of Christ, that you would give us ears to hear uh, the wonderful message that you have to say to us today. But Lord, uh, we ask that you would give us hearts to receive this word, that you would allow it to, that you would use it to transform us from the inside out, that what we believe would affect how we live. But God, only you can do this transformative work in our hearts and in our souls. And so, Lord, we desperately ask for you to do that work in our hearts today. God, we pray in all things that you would be honored and glorified. We ask this in Christ's wonderful name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn with me to Psalm chapter 8. Uh, Psalm chapter 8. Uh, and as you're turning there, uh, we are currently in a series uh, in the book of Psalms. Uh, if that wasn't already obvious. Uh, the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 hymns, poems, and prayers uh, that have served as the songbook of God's people for thousands of years, uh, up, into, uh, up until and including even today. Now, we're not going to look at all 150 of these psalms over the course of our series in this book, uh, but we will be looking at a sampling of them. Uh, so far, we have looked at Psalms 1, uh, 2, uh, 42, 46, and 47, and 139. Uh, and then to this list, we now get to add Psalm 8. And so hopefully you have a copy of God's Word open in front of you. And if so, would you with me uh, hear the Word of the Lord, as found in the book of Psalms, chapter 8. To the choir master, according to the Gatith, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory above the heavens. 
Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is God's word. Thanks be to him for speaking to us. Well, in general terms, uh, this psalm is categorized as a hymn of praise, uh, the first like it in the book so far. Uh, now, we're not given the context of this psalm, uh, but it may have originated from early on in David's life, uh, while he was still a shepherd tending sheep. Uh, so imagine young David, if you can, after a long day's work of feeding and leading his flock, uh, then lying down in the middle of a field, uh, gazing up into the nighttime sky. And at such a sight, he begins to contemplate, uh, as many of us as well have, uh, the majesty and the might of God, the maker of the universe. And in this moment, he is struck. He is struck by the greatness of God. And when he perceives, and what he perceives with his eyes leads him to worship with his lips. Charles Spurgeon, uh, my friend, uh, referred to this psalm as the song of the astronomer. Others have called it a psalm for stargazers, and I think that they're right. In this psalm, we see David praising God for his majesty and might as displayed in creation. And by penning these words, David is inviting you and me to do the very same thing. He's inviting us to see God's majesty as a king and his might as creator. He is, as one hymn has said it, the king of creation, the one who is worthy of our worship. Now, the psalm divides up into four sections, and as a whole, it echoes in many ways the opening chapters of the Bible the opening chapters of Genesis. The first and the last sections of this psalm praise God for his greatness and his glory. The second and the third sections are the psalmist's reflections on what God's majesty and might mean for mankind. Now, in, verse, in the first two verses, we see God's majesty and might proclaimed. In a press release uh, dated July 13th, 1969, NASA announced that the Apollo 11 astronauts uh, would take with them uh, goodwill messages um, from 72 of Earth's nations. Uh, these messages were collected, uh, photographed, uh, scaled down, and then inscribed uh, on a small disk the size of a 50 cent piece, a 50 cent coin. That disk was then carried in the sleeve of Buzz Aldrin's spacesuit. And among these messages was one from Pope Paul VI uh, of the Vatican. And in his message, the Pope included the text of Psalm 8, a psalm that rightly proclaims, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the, uh, all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. One week later, on July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 astronauts made history by setting foot on the surface of the moon, where they then placed this disc, and by extension, the words of this psalm. And what this uh, disc declares in miniature, the psalm and the universe de de declares in magnitude. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. So the next time that you look at the moon, and hopefully every time from now on that you look at the moon, you will be reminded of the words of this psalm. David begins this psalm by addressing this majestic and mighty God directly by using his personal name, Yahweh. 
which is translated in our English Bibles by the word Lord, spelled in all capital letters. This Lord is the one true God, the one who is, as Psalm 146 verse 6 tells us, the maker of heaven and earth. He is the one who has revealed himself in a special way through his inspired word, but then also in a general way through his created world. He is the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God who promised to send a Savior to rescue and redeem his wayward, rebellious, and sinful people. This is the one that David addresses. This is the one that David worships. David begins his worship right where we should begin ours, with God. The Lord's name is literally the first word on David's lips as he pens the words of this hymn. But notice how David makes it personal. He says, O Lord, our Lord. This isn't just the one true God. This is David's God. There's a relationship here. The God of the universe doesn't just exist. He desires a relationship with you and with me. Now, this isn't the God of deism, uh, who at one time created the world, but then has since left it and us all alone to ourselves. No, this is the God of the Bible. This is the God of Christianity. The one true God. The one who not only created us, but desires a relationship with us. And who sent his son to make that possible. Can we say, as David does here in this psalm, that this Lord is our Lord, our King, and our God. This was David's God. Is it your God? David goes on to say, as one commentator points out, uh, that this majestic name of God both permeates the earth and transcends the heavens. His glory and greatness not only fill the earth, they overflow into the entire universe. And just as David reminded us last week in Psalm 139, when he asked the question, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. There is nowhere where we can go where God is not present, not even to the moon. David tells us that God has set, that he has placed his glory above the heavens. This is the same verb used in Genesis, all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 17, where we're told how God set the moon, the sun, and the stars in the sky. And what this shows us is that when God placed them there in the sky, he was placing them there as witnesses to his glory and to his greatness. This is what David gets at in Psalm 19, verse 1, where he writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Creation itself testifies to the creativity of its creator. The sun, the moon, and the stars all do this. David does this. Do we do this? Do you do this? Now there's a discernible shift um, from verse 1 to verse 2. In verse 1, we're introduced to the heavens that proclaim the majesty and might of God. But in verse 2, we're introduced to those who rebel against this God. David refers to them as foes the enemy, and the avenger. These foes are symbols of human strength and arrogant rebellion. They deny what the heavens declare. But take note how the Lord responds to them. He doesn't triumph over them with the swords of uh, of an angelic army. He could have done that, but he doesn't. Instead, he chooses to triumph over them with the worship of earthly weakness. The babies and infants mentioned in in this psalm and in these verses are symbols of human weakness and frailty. But the Lord uses their worship to still his enemies. He uses the cry of the infant and the chatter of the, the baby to silence the arrogance of the wicked. Now Paul said something very similar to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 26 through 29 where he writes these words. He says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. 
but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Jesus himself quotes this verse uh, in Matthew chapter 21, verses 15 and 16, when he's confronted with the religious leaders after cleansing the temple and healing those who were blind and lame that came to him. And here's what Matthew records. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. Now it's easy to miss what's going on here, so listen carefully, listen closely. Not only does Jesus say that he is the promised king, he is the son of David, he goes further and he ups the ante by applying Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, a clear reference to God, he applies it to himself. And here's what this shows us. Jesus is the majestic and mighty God mentioned in this psalm. Amen? Amen. Here in these first two verses, we see the majesty and might of God proclaimed. But in the verses that follow, verses 3 and 4, we see mankind's response to his majesty and might. And it comes in the form of a question. But before we get there, though, let's look briefly at the verse, at verse 3. Much like people often do even today uh, on camping trips, uh, while sitting around the warmth of a campfire, Uh, David recounts a time when he surveyed the nighttime sky. Uh, He writes these words in uh, verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Now here again we find the verb set, mentioned before in verse 2, and which points us back uh, to Genesis. And this time, in this verse, it's an even clearer reference to God's work of creation. And so as vast and as expansive as the heavens seem from our earthly human perspective, David recognizes that they are but tiny and small in the hands of their creator. They are like Plato, shaped and molded by the fingers of God. And so let's, let's just uh, hit pause here for just a moment. Uh, because I want us to see something, I want us to notice something uh, that we often uh, overlook. Uh, We read this psalm in the context of 21st century American Christianity. Uh, But David and the rest of God's people back then read this psalm in a drastically different context. We live in a day and age when skeptics look at the sun, moon, and stars and conclude there is no God. But they lived in a day and age when pagans looked at the very same sun, moon, and stars and concluded those are all gods. And David reminds us here in this psalm that the sun, moon, and the stars, everything we see in the sky, are but the work of God's fingers. The sun, the moon, and the stars are not objects to be worshipped, but objects that compel us to worship the one who set them in place. And so just as people in David's day needed to recognize that there are not many gods, but only one true God, So people in our own day and age need to recognize that there is a God and that he created this world which so often takes our breath away when we stop to survey, just like David did, how incredibly vast, how fine-tuned, and how beautifully designed it really is. After surveying the stars, David responds to the majesty and might of God uh, displayed in creation uh, with a question in verse 4. He asks, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? What we see here as in verse 1 is that Psalm 8 is not just a hymn about God, but about God and our relationship with him. It's about the maker, but it's also about mankind. It's about the creator, but it's also about his creation, including you and me. Now, when compared with the greatness of God, the heavens seem so very small and insignificant. 
But when compared with the vastness of the heavens, it's humanity that seems so very small and insignificant. This is what David gets at in verse 4 with the question, what is man? To paraphrase, he's asking, of what importance are mere mortals in the grand scheme of the universe? And this sense is brought out by the way that David asks the question. Uh, He doesn't ask, who is man? Which would have been the typical way of asking such a question. Instead, he asks, what is man? Which only shows his sense of insignificance in light of God's greatness. And as Old Testament scholar Peter Craigie uh, explains, he says, the question is framed in such a manner that it evokes from the person without revelation the answer. Nothing in such vastness, it is inconceivable that human beings have significance or meaning. It is inconceivable that God, if there is a God, could remember each human being or give attention to each person. The poet deliberately creates this sense of despair in order to make the positive answer to the question when it comes in verses 5 through 8, all the more powerful. From an objective perspective, human beings are but the tiniest fragments in a giant universe. It is not conceivable that they could have significance or a central position in that universe. But the name of God, through which revelation comes indicates that the very opposite is true. If this psalm ended with David's question in verse 4, we would have to conclude that we really are insignificant. But it's not where the psalm ends. And so it's not where we're going to end either. In verses 5 through 8, we find the answer to the question raised in verse 4. Far from being insignificant, God created humanity in his image to bear responsibility for his creation. The king of creation crowns his image bearers with honor and he commissions them with a job to do. And so while gazing at the stars above us, it is quite easy to feel the ground beneath us. In looking up at the stars, it's easy and it's tempting to look down on ourselves. But in response to this feeling of insignificance, these verses speak of our value, our dignity, and our worth in our Creator's sight. As Danny Aiken points out, he says, We are described as a little lower than those in the heavenly realm, not a little higher than the animal realm. Evolution may say we are slightly above the beast, but God says we are just a little lower than himself and his angels. Brothers and sisters, we need to recognize that our identity isn't found by looking at the beasts around us, but by looking at the Creator who created us. God is the subject of the verbs in these verses. God has made him and crowned him. God has given him dominion and put all things under his feet. God is the one who defines us, and he has declared our value and our significance. A significance that is seen not only in creation, but in redemption. When Christ came to reconcile us back to our Creator. Our value comes not from what we do for ourselves, but from what God has done for us. Both in creating us, but then also in redeeming us. God created us in His image. In an image that we have distorted through our sin. But he is also conforming us into the image of Christ. The one who is, as Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So notice how the psalm uh, doesn't just say we are valuable to God. It shows us this. And the way that it does this is by showing how God, the king of creation, has delegated certain authority and responsibility to his image bearers for governing his creation. Verse 6 says that he has given humanity dominion over the works of his hands and has put all things under our feet. Notice how these words echo Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 where we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. These words from Genesis and these words from this psalm show us that God has given us the right to rule over his creation. Not so that we can do whatever we want, but so that we might reflect our God and his care and stewardship over it. As one commentator says it, God has placed all things under our feet, not so that we may walk all over them, but so that we might tend and care for them as Adam was instructed to do in the garden. This was God's design in creation, but it has since been distorted by the fall. Genesis 1 and 2 are followed by Genesis 3. Things are no longer as they were designed to be. We have been given authority over God's creation, but we've abused that authority. Instead of using it to worship God, we've used it to rebel against him. Psalm 8 looks back to a world before the fall, but it also points forward to the future, a future that arrived in a partial way with the first coming of Christ, and that will come in a complete way with the second coming of Christ. This is what the book of Hebrews tells us when it quotes this psalm in chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, to make the point that while we do not yet see all things in subjection to Christ, we do see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Paul picks up on this concept again, and he picks up on this concept in Ephesians chapter 1, where he writes about how Christ, having been raised from the dead, has now been seated at the right hand of God, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And how God has since put all things under his feet and has given him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul picks up on this passage again uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he writes about how Christ will return again to put all things under his feet, including the last enemy, which is death itself. So in this way, Psalm 8 points us back to the beginning, and it also points us forward to the end of God's story of redemption. It points us backward to the creation of the world, but it also points us forward to the restoration of this world, when all things will once again declare the majesty and might of the Almighty God. In verse 9, Uh, the final section of this psalm, we see the proclamation of God's majesty and might repeated. Uh, David ends his hymn the same way that he started it, uh, with worship. Uh, And by beginning and ending this way, David makes the central theme of his psalm clear. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. By repeating this verse at the end of the psalm, David helps us to understand why it is that God is worthy of this worship. He began the psalm with the declaration of God's majesty and might, and in the verses that followed that opening verse, he unpacks the reason for this declaration. And now here at the end, he repeats it. And in so doing, he is inviting us to sing with him this song. The words are the same here in verse 9 as they were at the beginning of verse 1. But David's desire is that our understanding, appreciation, and agreement with these words will have deepened over the course of the hymn. So even though the words themselves haven't changed over the course of this psalm, hopefully our hearts have. Meaning hopefully our sense of adoration and awe before this God has deepened. And so as we close, I want to do so by reading the words of the commentator Derek Kidner. And he says this, This psalm is an unsurpassed example of what a hymn should be, celebrating as it does the glory and grace of God, rehearsing who he is and what he has done in relating us and our world to him, all with the masterly economy of words and in a spirit of mingled joy and awe. 
It brings to light the unexpectedness of God's ways and the roles he has assigned to the strong and the weak, the spectacular and the obscure, the multitudinous and the few. But it begins and ends with God himself. And its overriding theme is how excellent is thy name. May we declare, as David did, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. On this side of the cross, may we recognize, believe in, and find our identity in Christ, the one who perfectly displays the majesty and the might of God when he gave his life to reconcile a sinful people to our creator God. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so very thankful for all that you've done. God, we thank you so much for the message of this psalm, the reminder that we receive from it. God, I pray whether this psalm is well known and dearly loved by those watching or whether it is otherwise unknown and having been heard for the first time today, that I pray that you would use its message to, to show us and reveal to us your majesty as our king and your might as our creator. I pray that we wouldn't just walk away and end this time together uh, in your word this morning, uh, walking away with more knowledge about you, but that we would come to recognize who you are and that we would respond rightly in light of who you are, that we would worship you just like David does in this psalm, and that we will declare not just, O oh Lord, but like him, be able to say, Our Lord. And so God, our prayer this morning is that you would make this repeated verse of this psalm the story of our lives, the anthem of our lives. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God, I pray that this would be an encouragement for all who already know you and who already believe in this message. But God, I pray on behalf of all those who do not yet know you, I pray, Lord, that you would show them yourself, reveal yourself to them in this time, and that they would repent of their sin, they would repent of their waywardness and their rebellion, and they would turn to Christ, the one who perfectly displays your majesty and your might when he came to die on the cross on, on our behalf. God, I pray that any who are listening to this who do not believe in you, that they would put their faith and hope and trust in you today. God, I thank you so much for this reminder in this psalm. I pray that you would uh, help us to live it out in our daily lives. We ask this all in Christ's wonderful name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us online this morning. Uh, if you have questions, uh, we would love to get in touch with you. Uh, the best way to do that is by going to gracejourneyorlando.com slash contact. Uh, if you have a prayer request, uh, you can submit that prayer request online by going to gracejourneyorlando.com slash prayer. Uh, and then if you are a guest with us, uh, we would love the opportunity to meet you. And so uh, introduce yourself. Uh, you can do that by going online and filling out our Connect card uh, at gracejourneyorlando.com slash connect card. And so uh, there's three web addresses. Uh, if you missed those, uh, they should be linked to in the comments if you're watching live on Facebook. And so uh, if we as a church can come alongside you in any way, uh, we would love the opportunity to do that. Uh, we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday, uh, either online uh, at 11 a.m. right here again on Facebook uh, or in person uh, at 1030 a.m. in our facility. Uh, let's go and declare the majesty and might of our great God as we go and make disciples. God bless you, church.